so now we go on to kind of the main topic of today's conversation now that we know all this, which is lazy ledger. Okay. So as we said before, uh, let's draw our blockchain again. Here is our blockchain. It's really nice that they have built-in arrows. So here's our blockchain. So we have our block headers, right? And they, you know, each uh, each block header will have a transaction root in here, right? It's going to have a transaction root in here, somewhere somewhere in the block header that commits to all the transactions here. So now we kind of note something interesting, which is in order to solve double spending, do we need to exclude invalid transactions? By invalid transaction, I mean you know a transaction that either double spends a UTXO or one that spends an invalid nonce. Uh, do we need to exclude them to prevent double spending? No, no, we no. just ignore them. We, make we, them we could, we, like ex exactly. If if those we could have a blockchain where those transactions are still in the blocks, but we just ignore them. Well, effectively, we're saying there's no such concept as an invalid transaction, right? Yes, that, that's exactly it, right? There's no such concept as an invalid transaction. Uh, and we let the application that runs on top of this ordered data decide its own validity rules. The only thing that we're doing at the consensus process is ordering zeros and ones. That's it. And the answer is, well, yes, we can do this. And this also means that the blockchain no longer has to do execution. And this is really good because the bottleneck right now, by far, in any contemporary blockchain is very much execution, right? Uh, you know, we target, uh, you know, we have some sort of virtual machine, say the EVM, we have an implementation of it, you know, say in Geth, and we target a particular amount of computing hardware for a full node, you know, say that's a computer, uh, you know, a consumer laptop, and then we have a particular validation rate. So that's how fast we want to be able to catch up to the head of the chain. And in Ethereum, it's somewhere around like 30 fold. So if we take Ethereum's 30 transactions per second, or 15, Multiply it by you know around 30 validation rate, you get 4 or 50, which is you know around the limit of what Geth can do if you just launch it on you know if you just run it locally. So we know that you know this is the, that that's our bottleneck. It's, there's there's no consensus bottleneck here. It's very much the execution. It's a very much the execution engine. Uh, so being able to remove execution from the base layer and just saying well we're just going to order zero, zeros and ones is good because now it means that we we no longer have that bottleneck. Okay. So how does lazy ledger work? So the way lazy ledger works is it commits to a list of messages. Let's call it this message root, where a message is just some zeros and ones. And the message does not have any effect on the lazy ledger state. And in kind of like the ideal academic lazy ledger, lazy ledger has no state at all. So the messages are just zeros and ones. They don't affect uh, the lazy ledger state. And in fact, there is no lazy ledger state. So what, what it will do is, you know, someone somehow we, we the, the the exact consensus process is orthogonal, and you know you can use any consensus protocol on top of Lazy Ledger. Which one you use kind of influences how much state you'll need in practice. Uh, if you're doing proof of work, you don't need any state to manage block producers. If you're doing proof of stake, then you're going to need some state somewhere, right? As part of you know some consensus critical state somewhere, uh, because you you know how else would you manage the validator set? Uh, but you know that's 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 basically like the bare minimum that you need. Everything else is just messages. Uh, so essentially, you just have a bunch of zeros and ones, uh, and then Lazy Ledger doesn't doesn't execute them. It just it just orders them. Uh, and then if you want to check to see is this block valid, you no longer need to execute the block to check if the block is valid. You only need to make sure that the block data is available. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what this means is that uh, a light node essentially has almost the same security guarantees as a full node. Like the light node is going to do some random sampling, uh, and if you know they have 100 light nodes and 100 full nodes, the full nodes can also do the, just this random sampling. And except for you know the one exception for this fraud proof here, which a anyone can generate, and b the nice thing is this is stateless. Uh, unlike you know a, a state transition fraud proof, the fraud proof of incorrect erasure coding. Uh, is stateless, which means, at, like, if one person checks one full block and tries to, you know, tries to construct a potentially a fraud proof for that one block, they don't need any previous blocks. They can do it entirely statelessly, uh, which yeah. is very good because it means that you can now distribute this work among many parties, as opposed to requiring one party with a very powerful computer that can fully validate, you know, say all transactions. 
so this being stateless is like a, is a, is a, is a, it makes it completely different. And the particular uh, implementation of lazy ledger is it proof of work or proof of stake? Uh, we can talk about the particular implementation okay. in just, just a couple of minutes. Uh, okay, so we're starting from the general one. Okay. It was starting from the general one. So, so the general mm -hmm. one is basically, except for this fraud proof stuff, which we can ignore again because of the fact that we can distribute it and we don't need one very powerful computer. You know, a light node essentially has the same security, has the same guarantees as a full node because they both just you know check if the data is available. And so long as there's a sufficient number of these nodes doing this, then yes, the data is available and yes, it can be reconstructed. And this is all you need to do. Uh, and so. Let's have an application which wants to use lazy ledger, right? Yes. So, so will fraud proofs be something that lazy ledger provides to me? Uh, so uh, the fraud, the, the, fraud, the fraud proofs that lazy ledger has natively are only for the data available, like mm -hmm. the erasure coding here. Right. And in our implementation, it's also for uh, transactions that mutate the lazy ledger state, such as basically just modifying the validator set, which is, you know, mm -hmm. again, this is like a trivial state. Right. Uh, so this is easy to do. In terms of if it can support application layer fraud proofs, and the answer is Lazy Ledger doesn't need to natively. Mm -hmm. Like the application can define its own fraud proof scheme, and since the application, like an, uh, now we're going to get into how applications work, and we can talk about the namespace Merkle tree in a second. Uh, so what you can do is you can have applications running on top of Lazy Ledger on top of the ordered data, and the, Lazy, uh, the application can define entirely its own execution system, which means you can get heterogeneous execution. Uh, you can't do this in a sharded context. Uh, you may have heard, for instance, heterogeneous sharding from Polkadot, uh, but they don't really have heterogeneous sharding because all of the shard, all of their shards or parachains execution systems all need to compile down to Wasm, which has a common metering. So they're not actually they don't they don't have different metering for each parachain. They all have the same metering. So there's actually homogeneous sharding. Uh, with Lazy Ledger, we actually have true heterogeneous sharding. You can define any like precompile you want in your application. For instance, you know, you could have a precompile that does something like you know find a collision for SHA-256 for one gas, and you could do that in your application. And Lazy Ledger doesn't care because Lazy Ledger just ordering zeros and ones. It doesn't actually execute anything. So it allows for true heterogeneous sharding, and it doesn't care what you do at the application layer. layer. Okay. Uh, before we get a little bit deeper into your questions, we can talk about the namespace Merkle tree. Uh, namespace name space Merkle tree. Uh, so what this does is it's a, it's a Merkle tree, uh, as, as you may have guessed. But essentially, each leaf, so here, so here's leaf, leaf one, leaf n, here's our root. So you know, you have you, your tree here. Uh, each of these leaves is associated with a namespace ID. So there's going to be plus namespace ID one, here it's going to be namespace ID n. Right? Uh, and you may look at this and you may say, well, this looks kind of like a Merkle sum tree. Uh, for those of you who uh, are maybe not familiar with Merkle sum trees, uh, it's essentially a construction for doing fraud proof style things on Bitcoin, where each transaction, you kind of add on some metadata of say how, much, how many fees this transaction pays. Uh, and then what you do is when you want to hash, uh, like when you have an internal node and you hash two leaves together, you concatenate this extra data. Uh, in the case of Merkle sum tree, it would be the amount of fees. In the case of the namespace Merkle tree, it's the namespace ID. And you kind of concatenate that together and you hash it. So you kind of get, as, as the root, you get a commitment. In this case of a Merkle sum tree, you get a commitment of all the fees that are collected in the block. Uh, so it allows you to have a fraud proof of uh, you know, the, the, the miner collected too many fees and they minted themselves too many coins. In our case, it allows us to have pr uh, range proofs, essentially, that uh, that particular messages, or messages from a particular namespace, uh, you, can, you, can, you can prove their inclusion. Uh, so each leaf, essentially, is one namespace ID associated with it. Uh, internal nodes, so an internal node has... Uh, and do those namespaces in any way... So, so like the hash function that is used for the intermediate nodes and the... Uh, Merkle tree, is it still just a shot to 56 or does it aggregate namespaces in some uh, special way? You can think of it like a SHA-256 that outputs, uh, okay, you already wrote it, outputs yes. it outputs a min and max namespace ID. Yes, so yeah, it's, you, it's you kind of, so, question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, so the, the, so the, the internal nodes will have both a min and max. Uh, so this is essentially a Merkle interval tree uh, and allows you to have range proofs. So then I can prove, assuming that leaves are ordered by their namespace ID, uh, you can prove that 
you you can provide a proof of all of all leaves for a particular namespace, and then mm -hmm. you know the whoever's verifying the proof knows that yes, these are all the leaves for a particular na namespace. Uh, uh, so the yeah, and then we of course uh, you know, assume or you know we construct it in a way that you know the, the leaves are ordered by the namespace ID. Uh, so what this means is applications aren't just you know blobs floating around. Is that you know each message is going to be associated with a namespace ID. Uh, and kind of this allows for the construction of what uh, the paper calls virtual sidechains, or what we call more recently uh, lazy ledger applications, uh, which you know it's essentially just a blockchain. It's a blockchain, but it commits its entire block. You know, it's associated with a namespace and just commits its entire block. Boom to lazy ledger, just the whole block. Like imagine and you have this, you know. Oh, is this Merkle tree per block? Is it just all the transactions in the block, or is it all the transactions in existence? It's of, all the like, transactions it, in a block. This is per block. Oh, that's per block. Okay. Yes, uh, we've been thinking if we can extend this to like cover multiple blocks to allow for, to allow for like better better sampling of of you know across epochs and stuff. Uh, that's kind of still that's kind of still a little bit of of, re of research topic. But for now, this is, this is per block. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So this is kind of how how lazy ledger works. Again, is that you can have an application just you know. However, it wants to reserve its namespace. Lazy Ledger doesn't care, uh, and then uh, just you know, just commits. You can you know, the, the the kind of the simplest case is that you know you have a blockchain, and then just it just takes this entire block and it just puts it as a message on Lazy Ledger, and Lazy Ledger will order them. So what this means is that if you run multiple of these together on top of Lazy Ledger, they essentially have shared security uh, because they have the same data availability guarantees, so that you can construct things like fraud proofs. Uh, which allow you to run secure light clients for one virtual chain that one virtual side chain that talks to another virtual side chain. So it's essentially you can think of them like shards at that point. Right. Uh, also, when you say sharding, right, you can you can shard different things, right? So in this case, lazy ledger na natively shards processing, right? Because lazy ledger validators don't process anything. Uh, well, and the... lazy, ledger, lazy ledger doesn't even because at no point do lazy ledger validators are they ever forced to validate any virtual side chain. Right. So, so, so they. But it, it allows, but it allows you, it allows you to build an application that shards execution. Yes. Right. You, you also shard state naturally because again, lazy ledger validators don't store any state, right? So it's only application validators that store state. But it doesn't shard networking, right? All the messages from all the virtual applications still have to go through the same uh, ledger, right? That's, that's correct. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so in Serenity, for example. Uh, all like uh, in, in Serenity, for example, if you're running, you know, a validator in, in Serenity, commonly called the AE2, uh, imprecisely in my opinion, uh, you every single validator needs to well, they need to fully validate the shard, the shard they are assigned to, but they also need to run data availability checks on all the other shards. Right, but they not. Uh... If you if you consider a validator in the in the Serenity, they are a full node. Uh, in the in the shards they track, right? But they light client nodes in all other shards, yep. right? While in lazy ledger, the actual validators that build the chain, right? The full nodes, in terms of like if we separate then loading data, then loading transactions, right? And uh, processing them. So in lazy ledger, every validator is a full node in terms of downloading all the transactions, but but no node, not even light node in terms of processing them, right? While in in Serenity. In terms of both processing and unloading, I'm a full node in one shard and a light node in a uh, ladder. Right? So I download I'm, less data. I'm not really fully convinced of that. I'm not really fully convinced of that distinction in practice for two reasons. Uh, the first reason is that, as I said above, the kind of the thing that you need to do here is the the only the only reason that you need to fully download a block is to, to compute this fraud proof. If you mm -hmm. if you're not going to try to compute a fraud proof, you never really need to. You never need to fully download a block, right? You just check to see if it's available. Right. Uh, but the thing is, computing this fraud proof is stateless. So instead, so why don't you just take like the validator set and just split it up into let's say 64 different chunks of validators and have them, you know, each validator just randomly assigns based on some VRF or just even some internal randomness, you know, 164th of each block or 164th of the blocks, mm -hmm. as in like you know every 64th block, give or take on an expectation, they just Try to you know fully download the block and compute its fraud proof, and then you 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 have the same thing. Right. Right. Well, it's, you can also assign. If I understand the construction correctly, right, you can also assign actually one sixty fourth of the block, 
right? You can have every validator then load some subset of rows and subset of columns. Yeah, that's you, you can, yeah. Right? yeah. Yeah, you can do stuff like that too. So yeah, so uh, in practice, it's because of the fact that you can parallelize almost you know, the things like computation here, and you can parallelize across, uh, across even multiple blocks uh, because of the fact that everything is stateless. It means that you, in practice, is not is not really good. it's not really a problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I think you had a few questions earlier. I, I think I answered some of them, but you probably some other ones are. Oh, so one one thing you asked, which I remember now, is proof of work or proof of stake. Yes. Right? Uh, so we'll, we'll... and what is the consensus? Yes. Yes. Uh, so we you know we can start with that, and then presumably we have other questions, and then you can ask them. So in terms of you know the technical stuff that I have to introduce, um, this is basically it. So now it's it's basically you can ask any questions you want. So proof of work, proof of stake, how we're implementing this, not how it's done in academia, right? Uh, so we went with proof of stake, and specifically the Tendermint consensus protocol, uh, because it offers pretty fast finality guarantees, uh, pretty good security guarantees, and pretty good performance. Uh, and it's one of those things that you know it. It is working there in production, right? Cosmos uses Tendermint. Many Cosmos zones use Tendermint. Uh, so it's been around for a decent amount of time, and they're a pretty good developer eco ecosystem and whatnot. Uh, so you know, it's one of those things where we don't really care what consensus protocol the lazy ledger, uh, le you know, the lazy ledger chain uses because it doesn't need to use a particular one. Uh, but in terms of if we had to choose one, you know, Tendermint is probably the most mature at this point in terms of proof of stake. And I might say, why not proof of work? Proof of work seems amazing. You don't need any state to manage the validator set in proof of state in proof of work, right? Because it's managed implicitly through through the through the work, uh, and, uh, and so you know, and the block headers are are cheaper and stuff. Uh, but the problem of proof of work is you kind of don't have this deterministic or like in immediate finality as soon as a block as soon as a block is there, which you get out of BFT protocols. And proof of work is it's 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 probabilistic, which is and then you have things like variable block times and whatnot. So it makes things generally just not as good. And right. uh, I recently posted uh, a thread on Twitter about accountable safety. By recently, I mean at the time of this recording, uh, not when it's when this when not when the YouTube recording is out. Uh, about accountable safety. So one thing that the Ethereum space has kind of been pushing very hard, which we should admire them for, is the concept of accountable safety. So if a reorg happens, if an equivocation happens, which you know. You, that, you know that happens, and usually the chain stops at that point because you know it says, "Okay, there's a safety violation." So you know it happens. Uh, what this means is you can identify at least one third of stakers, and then through off-chain coordination, you can you can burn their stake. Uh, and this is really really good because it means that you can penalize specifically attackers. And this isn't something that you can do in proof of work, right? In proof of work, if a majority of miners reorg the chain, you can't really penalize just them, right? Like it, the only thing you can do is you know you either tank the price for the coin forever, which isn't really great. It's kind of brittle, or you change the proof of work algorithm, which is now you're hurting everyone. You're not just hurting the miners that attacked. Uh, so proof of stake has this notion, or you know, modern proof of stake protocols have this notion of accountable safety, uh, which gives it, which allows it to have you know kind of very strong security guarantees. Uh, you know, it makes it very costly to to attack the system, and therefore it can have a much smaller security budget. Yep. Yeah, that's great. Uh, uh, Zaki, Zaki from Cosmos once told me that uh, if you are using BFT consensus, you you should be using Tendermint. I kind of agree with him. At least as of today, I think that is it. It is indeed the most mature consensus. Yeah, uh, as as the meme goes, it's uh, it's 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 all be, it's it's all Tendermint, and then you know Zaki goes, "Yep, it always has been." <laughs> You know, a lot of these proof of stake protocols reduce in some way and whatnot into some variation of Tendermint. Well, yeah, they use hot stuff, but it's uh, it's similar. Cool. Uh, so another question I have. So let's say I'm building an application, right? Uh, if I'm building an application, I use Laser Ledger as my data availability uh, layer. Now, uh, in order to have uh, state validity fraud proofs, I need uh, annotated uh, state routes. Yes. So the simplest way I see is I will just submit an extra transaction which says, oh, up until now, this is the state route we have, right? Or or rather, I guess, will we just submitting the state route as of after every transaction? Or uh, So how the application does it is application dependent, right? The application right, but, but do they depend. need to have... Like, my question is, can I use... An, like, it's pretty easy to build if I have another network, you know, where people agree on something. Like, for example, they order transactions, they compute the state route, and they submit it to Lazy Ledger. 
but can I do that without having an extra an extra protocol between the nodes? Can I only do it using lazy ledger plus? Uh, uh, general, generally, that makes things messy to kind of determine an ordering. And this kind of boils down to a lot of leader selection processes in optimistic rollups, uh, especially on Ethereum. Uh, and I wrote some posts about this you know, on merge consensus and whatnot. Uh, but you know, what you want is just ideally a permissionless consensus process. How you determine the, the leader is, is irrelevant for an optimistic rollup. It just has to be you know, deterministic, and the leader selection should be verifiable by eth Ethereum proper, uh, mm -hmm. in the case of optimistic rollups. And I'll explain how this you know, bridges to lazy ledger. Uh, so, you know, so one way you can do it is you can say, uh, you know, whoever submits the block first, they're the leader. Right. Another way you could do it is you run you run some small process that does some say round robin or you know you run some randa or something uh, and you randomly select a leader. Uh, so you 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 can do these things. Uh, but the trick is all of these processes to elect a leader. Uh, you can uh, you don't like the way it works in Ethereum because of how Ethereum is kind of limited in its execution system. The leader selection needs to kind of be verifiable by Ethereum proper. In Lazy Ledger, if you're building a Lazy Ledger native application, you don't really care. Like Lazy Ledger doesn't care who the leader is. So basically, anyone can submit a block at any time. And kind of to give you some intuitions about this is, imagine that you're in a in Bitcoin, for instance. Do you agree that someone could just create a Bitcoin block and just distribute it out in the network? Yeah. So now imagine you take that block and you just put it put it as a message on Lazy Ledger. So note that the person who puts it as a la message on Lazy Ledger doesn't need permission from Lazy Ledger, and it doesn't need permission from anyone inside this this virtual sidechain. Just like how a miner doesn't need permission from the other, it doesn't need permission from the Bitcoin network to mine a block and distribute it to the peer-to-peer -peer network, right? Mm -hmm. The trick is, you need that uh, you need to have you you need to have it so that verifying if a block header is valid. In other words, if you know if the leader if the presumed leader had the right to produce this block needs to be exponentially cheaper than verifying the full block. As long as you have a condition like that, then there's there's no there's no problem if anyone can submit any message for any namespace ID and you don't care. It's like imagine someone goes on Bitcoin and they try to distribute an Ethereum block header throughout the peer-to-peer -peer network. Nothing nothing bad happens, right? It just gets dropped. Like in this right. case, okay, someone it includes, you know, an Ethereum virtual sidechain block header in the Bitcoin virtual sidechain. So the you know the Bitcoin nodes the, the Bitcoin virtual sidechain nodes, which are you know running the application, they see that you know they see this this clear this thing clearly doesn't belong here, so they just ignore it, just like just like they would in a, the in the peer to peer network. Does that right. answer your question? Yes, yes, I think so. So effectively, the point is, uh, I guess my question was whether it's the case that uh, uh, there is some way of building applications which is simpler than building an optimistic crop. Right. Uh, uh, so, close to no. Right. Uh, yes and no. Uh, it's slightly simpler than an optimistic rollup because you're not limited by the EVM. Mm -hmm. How the application itself decides the fraud proofs is not. You don't have to implement, say, you know, interpreter in the EVM. Uh, and right. implementing an interpreter for fraud proofs in the EVM is actually non-trivial. Right. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. especially doing it in a gas in a you know in a way that doesn't use up all the gas is is non-trivial. Here you have access to native code to execute the fraud proofs, uh, mm -hmm. which means that things get much easier on that front. Right. Uh, also, in terms of things like timing and whatnot, uh, you can imagine, for example, a gossip network overlaid on top of the lazy ledger nodes for each virtual sidechain, right? So mm -hmm. it's like a, it's like a just some subset of the nodes, and they're gossiping based on your know, topics. So each topic is the same namespace ID. Uh, so people can actually, or you can have fraud proofs for a virtual sidechain be gossiped around in the peer-to-peer -peer network, uh, which is something that you can't do in an optimistic rollup, right? In an optimistic rollup, you have to post a fraud proof. On Ethereum, with with lazy ledger vir like native virtual sidechains, you can actually distribute the the fraud proofs to, in the peer to peer network, and they'll actually take effect, uh, even if you know even if it takes a long time to get the fraud proof included in lazy ledger, uh, the kind of off chain applications are still going to take that into account. So in right. some ways, it's like it's slightly easier in some ways because you don't have to worry about timing as much for fraud proofs. You don't have to worry about building an interpreter for your execution system and gas limits and whatnot. Uh, so in that sense, it's easier. In terms of, uh, yeah, and in terms of things like you know bootstrapping a new chain, uh, one slight issue with Cosmos owns is you have to bootstrap their security, right? Like every single Cosmos owns need to have a validator set. 
uh, you know, you have to run proof of stake. Uh, it needs to have its own security guarantees and and you know and so on, right? Uh, with Lazy Ledger, you don't really need a big you know validator set doing proof of stake. You just need some way of deciding a leader for the next block of the virtual sidechain, and that can be very simple, right? And you can do that and say like you know some other application that that's all it does. It just you know decides leaders for for these virtual sidechains. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and I have one more question, which is a little bit. Uh... I would say it's slightly orthogonal, but uh, but it's interesting because you mentioned sharding, right? So uh, if we compare Cosmos versus, uh, well, I would put Polkadot and Near into the same bucket from this perspective. On Cosmos, uh, if you have two zones, right? So so sharding is uh, is only meaningful in my opinion if if there is way at least to to move assets between applications. I ideally do something more than that, right? Uh, but yeah. but let's say we just want to move assets. So on Cosmos. Uh, if you move assets from one zone to another, uh, then uh, oh, then what happens if then we later realize that the first zone was actually corrupted, uh, and the and the because the second zone they will be acting as a light client, right? So as a light client, they verified the the root. It was correct. Merkle proof matched. So let's say later we actually do realize that uh, there was an invalid state transition, All right? So in Cosmos, they they effectively have a philosophy which says there's no such thing as an invalid state transition. Any state transition on which tendermint consensus is reached is valid by definition, right? So if state root does not match transactions, that is still a valid state transition as long as tendermint consensus is reached, right? So from this perspective, you don't need any fraud proofs. Uh, but in Polkadot uh, and in Near, if you uh, submit a uh, cross-chain communication from one shard to another or from one parachain case of Polkadot to another, and then later it turns out that the first parachain had an invalid state transition, uh, what happens that in both near and Polkadot, both chains will get rolled back, right? Uh, but in Lazy Ledger, uh, the latter is definitely uh, not something that is easily implementable unless unless those shards in in advance agree upon having this shared security, right? So, so, so do you have any thinking yes. around how that will be happening? Yeah. So uh, first of all, kind of a few notes, which is that unlike uh, say Cosmos zones or just new side chains, uh, if uh, if the virtual applications uh, or virtual sidechains on top of Lazy Ledger uh, make use of Lazy Ledger as a data availability layer, then you can be guaranteed that since data is available, fraud proofs can always be made, uh, which right. is something that you can't guarantee with sidechains. Uh, so one thing that's nice is Cosmos zones, if they want to, they don't have to, but if they want to, they can opt in and essentially just post all their blocks to Lazy Ledger. So this will allow them to share security. Uh, so in terms of uh, how, fraud proof for, how fraud proofs work and how you know different virtual side chains that are like shards would communicate, uh, the answer is it specifically depends on what the execution system wants to do. Uh, so one potentially nice thing is you don't have to worry about rollbacks. Lazy Ledger doesn't have to worry about rollbacks, right? Rollbacks in terms of the state of these virtual side chains is only determined by what the virtual side chains run. Right? Lazy Ledger, you don't have to worry about Lazy Ledger rolling back because one this one virtual sidechain had had some invalid state transition in it, right? And in sharding systems, you know, if one shard has an invalid state, that's when things get really messy, right? Because then it's like, do you roll back just the shard? Then people, you know, keep the money they're stolen. Do you roll back the whole system? Then things get a bit messy, right? So there's like, there's, there's a little bit tricky there. Well, there's ledger, you don't have to worry about that because it's, you know, it's all done at the application layer. So uh, essentially two applications would have to kind of agree to be part of a network with shared security, where they'll you know accept uh, you know accept being able to process fraud proofs. Uh, th this is assuming that you don't go the optimistic rollup route, where you, let's say you have like one virtual machine that's Turing complete with a high gas limit that allows for you know trustless two-way bridges, and then uh, different virtual uh, virtual side chains can use this as a hub. With that one option is you know having a hub, kind of like you know you just run like the EVM for instance, right? Some Turing complete virtual machine, and this acts as a hub that you know various virtual sidechains can use to to move assets around uh, indirectly. The other alternative is you know they can communicate directly with each other uh, without going through this hub, and uh, this essentially means that you know they would have to run you know to have to 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 be secure they would have to run both a light client of you know the other virtual sidechains, which in this case the light a light client of the other virtual sidechains is is pretty easy because it's not much more work than just running a lazy ledger like client, right? And you know, downloading a few extra block headers. And they would need to have some way of executing fraud proofs uh, for, 
yeah, for, for the state validity. And how you do that is kind of an implementation detail on one on the one hand. On the other hand, it's a tricky implementation detail, yes, because you know the ideal situation is each uh, each namespace or each application, let's say, because you know namespaces are permissionless. Let's say each application defines in the ideal case. Uh, this is something we're still ironing out, but you know, let's say each application defines in Wasm code or you know EVM code or something how to execute fraud proofs. Uh, and then, you know, if you want to execute a fraud proof, you just take the fraud proof and load it into this execution engine and see you see it does spit out true or false. Uh, so that's kind of uh, you can either do that or you can run native code. Uh, native code is a bit trickier because you know there's possibilities for you know resource exhaustion attacks and exploits and whatnot. Uh, but you know you just have you just need some standardized way, uh, which technically it doesn't have to be. It's not enforced by Lazy Ledger. Applications can do whatever they want, right? And I'm I'm going to guess that in the future there's going to be multiple standards for how to define this. You just need to have some standard standard of being able to essentially load the execution, the execution engine, and you know have it be able to process a fraud proof. Right. So the way the way I hear your answer is that, or rather the uh, the, the the next step I see happening is, you, you know, like Polkadot, Near, Serenity, all, all the systems that today have their own data availability schemes, they all started before there was any data availability standard, right? So, so if we imagine Lazy Ledger becoming the de facto data availability standard, then it's, it's just that the next, if there's a next generation of blockchains, they will just have one less problem to solve, right? They can just resort to using Lazy Ledger as a data availability, and then they can have, like, you know, Polkadot can build their parachains with their specific way of state validity proofs and rolling back the relay chain. Is it called relay chain? Yeah, relay chain. I think so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and that's actually a good point that you bring up, which is what I want to touch on, which is that uh, Lazy Ledger doesn't inherently compete with any other layer one because it can't. It doesn't have a native execution layer. Uh, and in Lazy Ledger, and this is kind of one thing I want to make extra clear so no one calls me like a shill or anything, Lazy Ledger does not provide a scalable execution layer. What it provides is a scalable data availability layer. In other words, you can just fit a whole bunch of bytes per second through it with high security guarantees, uh, like the highest security guarantees and the most bytes per second, because it completely removes execution. Uh, if you want to build a scalable execution layer on top of it, this could be sharding. Uh, this could be, you know, you exploit a whole bunch of parallelism, like, like the Solana guys, right? You have like a really optimized, like down bare metal execution system. And you, know, you can build that. Uh, you can build any execution system you want on top of Lazy Ledger, but Lazy Ledger native doesn't provide on its own uh, any execution system, let alone a scalable one. Uh, so in that sense, uh, it's, Lazy Ledger is nice because it's completely agnostic in which blockchains can use it for a data availability layer, right? So like you said, you know, Nier can use it, Polkadot can use it, Serenity can use it, Ethereum can use it, Bitcoin can use it, uh, you know, Solana can use it, all of these chains can use it, you know, Cosmos can use it. Uh, all of these chains can use it, and now you can actually, you know, do this, you know, scaling by altcoins thing, which you know used to be terrible because you lose security. Now they all have the shared security, and in fact, you know, potentially additive security if they all pay fees together. Uh, and then they can actually, you know, you can actually now do proper, uh, you know, experimentation with various execution engines, with various trade-offs and whatnot, all without losing, you know, security guarantees. Right. Yeah, that's great. Uh, and well, the last question I have uh, is uh, uh, Lazy Ledger still needs to do some, uh, like, first of all, if it's proof of stake, right? Besides maintaining validator set, we also need to be paying them rewards, right? Also, uh, as transactions are being submitted, there's got to be, it cannot be free, right? Transactions must be, uh, like, something must be paid when the transaction is submitted, right? So, yeah. so that means that Lazy Ledger at least implements the very basic transfers functionality, right? Yes. Uh, so I can go over that uh, briefly in, in terms of, uh, so first the kind of ideal idealized situation that was presented in the paper, uh, which is that you just run a virtual, you run a virtual sidechain and that virtual sidechain does things like manage the validator set, handles fee payments and whatnot. Uh, and that's kind of the idealized version. Uh, in practice, it's the case that if you have something that's consensus critical, then you might as well just try it. Like it's just it's just simpler if you're just enshrine it. Then you don't have to go through different levels and direction. You don't have to worry about constrained execution environments and so on. You just you know just enshrine it and just do it natively. So lazy ledger, since we're using proof of stake, like you said, and since we want to pay for fees, both of those things, 
there is like a very, very minimal execution execution system in, in our current design of Lazy Ledger. And basically the only thing it does is it manages validator set and it handles fee payments. That's all it does. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, so, so, so let me think how it fits because, because bef until, until this moment, right. We assumed that like, like, for example, that no validator needs to execute all the transactions, right? So other transactions that, va that change the state, are, are they in a separate sort of zone in the block? Yes. Where, which is which is heavily yeah. limited. In terms yeah. Of so size. what we what we do is we have a reserved namespace for consensus critical consensus critical messages, uh, and another you know any other namespace is used for you know, arbitrary messages. So these consensus critical messages like transactions and whatnot, uh, yeah, we we we're going to you know heavily restrict how how much how much how many how many of those can be in a block. So mm -hmm. that you know, running a full node, maybe you can even do it on a phone because you know, just just what, just moving balances around, and you're just doing a small number of those. Right, and and I presume that actual transfer of lazy ledger native currency, whatever it is, is not the intended use case, right? So, so if you want yes. to be transferring or exchanging, you you should be moving to uh, to one of the L2s built on top, right? So, yep. so, yep. so the transactions effectively should only be happening if a, uh, I actually want to become and or stop being a validator. Yep. Right. Yep. Or if if I want to move move my lazy ledger coins to some side chain or or take them out, right? So so that should be relatively. Yeah. So it's ba it's basically that and paying for fees because yes. each message needs to have a, a fee payment associated with it. But can can this not be solved using the sum tree, the sum Merkle tree? Uh. As opposed to what? Oh, oh so I, I thought you're suggesting that the messages that. Uh, the transactions that pay for the messages also go into this restricted part of the block. Yeah. While it feels to me that because you're paying for every message included into the block, then we can just have. Uh, uh, well, right now I'm discussing like something that's technically you can consider like a design detail. Uh, so yeah. if you're saying, could you do this other thing? Then the answer is, well, maybe you could mm -hmm. do this other thing. I'm just describing the way we've done it now. So the way yeah, we've done it now, uh, you know how the like op return works in Bitcoin? No. Because like you. Uh, okay, v very briefly, the the, the, the op return is just like op return and then some bytes of data, and then that output becomes prunable, it's unspendable. Uh, but it means that you can record those, like, I think it's 80 bytes or something along those lines of data in, in the Bitcoin blockchain. Mm -hmm. and, then, and there's no reason to stop it at 80, you can make it a gigabyte if you want. Uh, the problem of doing it that way is that in order to fully validate this chain or the sanctity of the coin, you still have to download all those op return data. But you shouldn't have to. So the way we've done it in Lazy Ledger is essentially you have a transaction that pays for a message, but you don't include the message in the transaction. You just include a hash of it, mm -hmm. and the, the message is going to be somewhere else in the block. I see. So, so the intended use case is that messages are pretty large, right? Yeah. So people should Ma be messages could be very, very large. Yes. I see. I see. Right. <clears throat> that makes sense. Cool. Okay. So, so I don't have any more questions. Uh, right. So that was uh, that was a lot of interesting information uh, and. Uh, I guess data availability is uh, not something we discussed frequently in the whiteboard sessions. So I think it's uh, 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 overall was a, a lot of new information for many people. So thanks a lot for uh, for coming. Uh, and uh, 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 we always ask one final question, which is not technical, which is how soon is the is the launch? I'm gonna pull out a meme and say 18 months, uh, but uh, but. But unironically, un unironically. So some, uh, the nice thing about Lazy Ledger is that you know the system that I've described here. If you think about it, since there's no high performance, you know, uh, execution system, since there's no, you know, like rapidly switching your know, gossip network of, of shards around and you know, subcommittees and all that stuff, it's actually fairly straightforward, right? Yes. Uh, the, the the trick is you know you have to understand how data availability proofs work and the implications of them and you know make sure you design things like transaction systems that don't include entire messages and stuff like that. Uh, but you know once you have these details in place, then it's just really just a matter of implementation. There's not really any unanswered research questions in this. That's the nice thing. Uh, so yeah, we expect we expect you know somewhere you know keep on the lookout somewhere you know 18 months in in that time range for a test net pessimistically. Awesome, great, sounds great. Okay. Again, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for coming.